Sorry. Um, anyways, uh, if you didn't hear what uh, Pastor Bonnie said, my name's Joe. I'm the director of student ministries here at the Vineyard Great Falls. And I haven't been on staff a super long time. I came on back in January. I've been here just long enough to get the staff-issued staff uniform of a flannel with jeans to preach up front with. <laughs> so um, just long enough to there. But I haven't even gotten to meet everybody in our congregation yet. I know many of you haven't gotten to meet me um, and so a lot of times people, you know, we're introducing ourselves and I'm telling them who I am, or I've heard people lovingly refer to me as the guy with the mullet. I'm assuming that that's loving. Um, and uh, the truth is, is I take no offense to that. Uh, but the question I usually get is, why do you have a mullet? And uh, the, the real deal behind it was last summer, I made a deal with one of my middle school friends because I run a ministry outside of the vineyard called Young Life. And I hang out with the coolest middle schoolers you'll ever meet. And I made a deal with one of them that if he would go to camp with me last summer, that I would cut my hair, which used to be really, really long, into a mullet. And he fulfilled every part of that, went to camp with me. So I went to um, get my hair cut into a mullet. Now, that's how I ended up here. The question really begs more of, why do you still have a mullet nearly a year later? Um, and that is really for two main reasons. Um, the first one is when I dis- uh, came home after making this deal with my middle school buddy, um, I told my wife, Katie, um, that I was going to get my hair cut into a mullet. And as Tammy put it last week, she gave me the most loving advice and said, I don't think you're in a season of life where a mullet makes a lot of sense. And uh, as a very spirit-filled and discerning husband, I made an appointment immediately the next day to go get my hair cut into a mullet. And uh, so I go get my hair cut, and I'm coming back home, and I walk in through the door, and Katie's in the kitchen, and she just stops what she's doing and stares at me. And she looks at me like this. And then she does this. But I was ready. I had been practicing the whole car ride home, what I was going to say. So I went into it. Yeah, I know you didn't want, you don't think. And I went through my whole spiel. And the whole time, she just looked at me like this. And so finally, after some awkward silence, I said, well, she said, I'm not supposed to like it. And so if my wife likes it, I figured I should keep it at least for a little while. Um, And so that was reason number one. Reason number two actually is that when I got my hair cut into a mullet last summer, I actually was in the part of my reading plan for the summer where I was going through the Gospels. Um, And if you do a Bible uh, reading plan, um, you have a specific time you spend in each book. And so I happened to be going through the Gospels. And as I was reading through the Gospels, something really started to stand out to me and struck me um, very profoundly. And that was that there, I believe that there is biblical evidence that Jesus had the first ever mullet. (laughs) No, 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 no. Hear me out. Hear me out on this. Now, we all know the saying about a mullet, right? It's business in the front and party in the back, right? So when we look at scripture and we look at Jesus's life, I think we can all see that he was business, right? He even says, I'm about my father's business. And when he walked into the temple and he saw the merchants and people being taken advantage of and his house, his father's house being just wrecked, he turned tables, he shooed people away, and he was serious in that moment and about his business. But we also know this about Jesus, that he hung out with sinners And that the very first miracle ever recorded when he turned water into wine happened at a party. Business in the front, party in the back. Jesus had the first ever mullet. You heard it here first, Vineyard Great Falls. And if you feel like that's blasphemy, you found it at another building elsewhere on a Sunday morning. So, but all joking aside, um, today is actually a really awesome day. Um, If you are not familiar with what today is, today is Palm Sunday which is the kickoff to what has become known as Holy Week that leads into the single most important event in Christian history, the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Palm Survey, Palm Survey, Palm Sunday is observed in many churches across our nation and across the world with a traditional recounting of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And guess what? We're one of those churches. So today we're going to talk about Jesus' triumphal entry into into Jerusalem. Now, some fun facts that you may not know about the triumphal entry account. 
is that it is one of the few events that occurred in Jesus's life that is recorded in all four gospels. All four of them have an account of the triumphal entry, as well as the events that follow over the next week, all the way up to Jesus's death and resurrection. And actually, it's so significant that it makes up about one-fourth of the book of Matthew. It makes up about one-third of the book of Mark. It makes up about one-fifth of the book of Luke. And it makes up about two-fifths of the book of John. Now, if you add all those numbers up and you put them together, that is nearly half of the Gospels account for one week of Jesus's life from the triumphal entry to his death and resurrection. So when we say this is a significant event, it is extremely significant. The gospel writers thought it was so important that they spent nearly half of their writings talking about it. Now, the triumphal entry, you may think, well, it's probably in all four because it was a super easy event to record. (laughs) And we could just say, hey, he rode in on a donkey, palm trees were laid down, cloaks are on the ground, here's what happened. Um, And yeah, it probably was fairly easy and simple to record, but it also bookmarks an essential starting point for significant portions of the gospel, for each one of the gospel writers. And on top of that, because it's in all four gospels, it, create, it creates corroborating evidence of the truth of the gospel because those accounts do not differ. And so it's a very significant event in Scripture. Now, you might be wondering, well, why do they even call it the triumphal entry? Didn't Jesus die? Didn't you just say that? Yes, he did die. But a little bit of a history lesson for you. Um, this is actually, triumph is actually a Roman term. And so triumph was a celebration or parade that was given to a Roman general on returning from battle if they were victorious and he slain over 5,000 people in that battle. So when we talk about a triumph, it's really a Roman celebration and parade. And when they would have these, this would actually elevate the Roman general to a king-like status, and even in some people's eyes, almost a divine-like status. And so when they held these celebrations, they were looking at a king, almost like a king and almost like a god. So I think it's only fitting that we call Jesus' entry into Jerusalem a triumphal entry. Because... If you're not super familiar, and I'm a numbers guy, and so numbers like 5,000, they stick out to me. And I go, well, why does it have to be 5,000? Why couldn't it be 4,000 or 3,000? But I think our God likes to, to put a little bit of extra into Scripture to make sure that his point is driven home. And so when I heard that number 5,000, I was like, I've heard that somewhere else in Scripture. So I started combing. And sure enough, in Acts chapter 4, verse 4, there it is, the number 5,000. And if you're familiar, Acts follows the Gospels, and it is after Jesus has ascended into heaven. And in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John are teaching the people about the truth of the Gospel. And it says in verse 4 that almost 5,000 people were slain by the truth of the Gospel and became believers. So the Romans used it to celebrate slaying people to death. We get to use it to celebrate people coming to know Christ. And that's a pretty cool thing when you think about how detailed our God is. So today we are not going to look at all four accounts of the triumphal entry. We are going to focus on one specific account, which is the account of Mark. And that begins in uh, the book of Mark, obviously, in chapter 11, verse 1. Um, But before we jump into that, I actually want to share a little story with you of an experience I had um, that I think kind of plays right into this. So for those of you who have gotten to know me, um, you probably have discerned that I am in a huge Ohio State Buckeyes fan. I oh yes, right there. There's always one. First service, I don't know if we had a lot of people following Jesus because nobody yelled it out, but uh, just kidding, just kidding. We have a lot of people in the first service that did. But... 
So I grew up in Oklahoma, not in Ohio, but my dad's side of the family was all from Ohio, so it was born into me that I was going to be a Buckeye fan. And I grew up watching everything Ohio State, football, basketball, even soccer. They were in the championship for soccer when I was younger. Um, everything that I could watch, I did. And so every Saturday morning during the fall, my dad and I would get up and we would watch the Buckeyes play, and it was a big thing. But I had never been to a game, never traveled to this, the campus, never anything. I just watched on TV. So I had an expectation of kind of what it might feel like, look like, but never had experienced it for myself. Well, when I got to college, my dad called me up uh, one November and he said, hey, I've got a surprise for you. I got tickets for us to go to an Ohio State football game, which I was elated for. But it wasn't just any game. It was the game. And if you're a football fan, you know what the game is. That is Ohio State, Michigan, the biggest rivalry in all of college sports. Sorry, Grizz and Cat fans, but it is true, even though I love that rivalry too. Um, millions of people watch it every year. It's usually the highest attended uh, game as well as viewed on TV game every single college football season. And I got to go. And to top that off, Ohio State was undefeated, Michigan was undefeated, and they were number one and number two. So I was really excited to get to go to this game. So we drove up on a Friday night, stayed in a hotel, and I had found out that ESPN game day was going to be there. It was going to be this whole big thing. And so I was super excited. So we got up super early on Saturday morning to go in. And if you've ever been down there, um, the main highway that runs through there, you exit off. And then the stadium's off kind of in the distance a couple miles out. Um, and so we drove out. Um, I actually, the night before, had made a sign. Um, and the quarterback for Ohio State at the time was Troy Smith and said, Troy Smith for Heisman. Um, he got cheated, should have won it that year. But um, anyways, um, he, uh, I made this sign because I was like, I'm going to be on game day and it's going to be awesome. And everyone's going to see this sign. And then Troy Smith's going to be like, hey, why don't you come hang out with me because you love me so much or something like that was going to happen. Um, and anyways, so we get, off, we get close to the exit, probably about a quarter mile, half mile from the exit. And all of a sudden, the car just stops. There is a line of cars to the exit at like 5.30 in the morning for a one o'clock game. And so we finally make it off the exit. And as we're going off, I can finally see, and it's just nothing but red, as far as I can see, all the way to the stadium with a few just little blue dots that were there just for profiling purposes, I think, more than anything. But um, so we finally find a quick parking spot because we're like, if we don't park now, we may not find one. We get out and we're walking through this sea of red Ohio State fans and we're making our way because I'm bound to determine to be at college game day, to be on TV and to be a part of that excitement that I had watched on TV growing up. And so I, we went to college game day and... Um, I held up my sign and I definitely wasn't seeing because it was like a six foot six guy right in front of me. And so, did, but I really was unimpressed with college game day. If you've ever been to it, it's like a podium about this high with little chairs and like a screen behind it. It's not really as cool as it looks on TV, uh, but it still was a fun experience. Um, and so then after game day, we walked down to the stadium where the players were going to come in and enter into the stadium. And so we're along that side and I'm so excited, hoping I'm going to get a glimpse of Troy Smith. And I see him and he's actually walking on the side that I'm at. And the only thing I could think to do, because everybody's screaming his name, to maybe get his attention, is throw down my sign on the ground in front of him, hoping he sees it, reads it, and then stops and is like, again, hey, let's go hang out after the game. We can see what it's like. None of that happened. Troy Smith literally walked right across the top of it and just kept on going, didn't pay any attention to it. So it wasn't quite the palm tree or cloak experience that I was hoping for at the time. Um, but what was really cool and all of those things were things I expected to see at this game and be a part of, um, as well as the Ohio State victory that was, was inevitable and took place that day. Um, but the really cool thing that I got to experience that I didn't expect actually came at halftime of that game. Um, so if you know anything about Ohio State, um, you might know, which I didn't at the time, that they have an amazing marching band like one of the best in the country, and they do some phenomenal shows. The only thing I really knew is they do this script Ohio thing, and it's a big tradition and a big deal if you get to dot the I. But I didn't know anything else about them. And so they came out, and they were like, it looked like they were like disorganized. And I was like, oh, this is kind of embarrassing. They're like playing, but they're all... And, and then all of a sudden, during one part of the song, they just all took four steps, and they were in the shape of like Pirates of the Caribbean ship, and they start moving together, and there's like waves. And it was like the craziest 
craziest thing that I had ever seen, and I had no idea that that was going to be a part of that. And I think that story, and the reason I told it, is because I think when we look at the triumphal entry story, that was similar for the Israelites. They had an idea, an expectation of when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem and what that would be about and what it would be like, but they didn't know everything. And they didn't have an expectation for what was to follow in the week to come. And so as we jump into our story together, I think it's important to know the context of what happened right up leading to this. So Jesus has been uh, traveling all around uh, Israel for about three years at this point with his disciples. Um, They've been teaching in different cities. They've been uh, casting out demons, healing blind people, raising people from the dead, doing all sorts of miracles. Jesus has been doing all of this. But within all of that, every time he would do something, he would say, go your way, but don't tell anyone who I am. And he would not announce who he was at that time. Well, the triumphal entry is actually Jesus's first time that he says to the entire nation of Israel and everyone that was there in Jerusalem, this is who I am. And he announces it out loud with how he enters. Now, something also that's important to understand is why they're going to Jerusalem. So they're coming from Jericho where he'd just been teaching and he had healed a blind man. And he's just uh, coming from Jericho into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And if you're not familiar with the Passover, the Passover was a week-long festival with meals and rituals and different things that they did to celebrate God, uh, God bringing them out of oppression from the Egyptians who had enslaved them. So if you remember all the way back to Old Testament, um, God used Moses to bring the Egyptians out of slavery, or excuse me, bring the Israelites out of slavery from under the Egyptians. And I think that's important to remember in this story. And the reason I believe that's important to remember is because that's the mindset and the lens through which the Israelites would be viewing going into Jerusalem as they gathered. That, hey, we're celebrating God delivering us from slavery and oppression, And maybe, just maybe, they're thinking about that in current times, about how they're being oppressed by the Romans, and they're praying for God to deliver them from that oppression as they head into that week. So we're going to pick it up in Mark 11, beginning at verse 1. It says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming of our father David, or the kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. So there are a lot of amazing elements to those short 10 verses. I mean, we could go on about the palm trees, the cloaks, the donkey, um, all of that, and we could spend a lot of time on that. But today, I actually want us to kind of reverse that, and I want us to think about the viewpoint of the Israelites as Jesus is entering in. What were they thinking? Why were they saying what they're saying? And why does that matter in the context to us? So as Jesus is entering into Jerusalem, we see the people begin to gather. It says that they start throwing down their cloaks on the ground. They throw down palm trees or leafy branches, which was a symbol of victory. That was a common practice um, to celebrate, and it was a symbolizing victory. And so they believe, and we can see it in that, that Jesus is important, right? This was a common practice for kings, and so they may even have viewed him as a potential king for the Israelites. 
Well, we see beginning in verse 9 what starts to come out of their mouth, and we hear what it is that they say, and they say, Hosanna, Hosanna. Now, if you're not familiar with what Hosanna means, it's really simple. It means save us, save us. So they're literally, as Jesus is riding in on this donkey, yelling at him, save us, save us. And I think that, again, clues us into this idea that the Israelites are seeing Jesus as a potential savior. But if we go back to why they're in Jerusalem and the Passover and the, the savior that Moses was to them when he helped God used him to remove them from the oppression of the, of the Egyptians, they might not have been viewing it the way we view savior. And when we hear that word, they would have been looking at him going, save us from the oppression of the Romans. Save us from the taxes that are so burdensome that I can't even feed my own family. Save us from this. And I think we see that even in the lines that follow. It talks about in the name of the Lord, um, in the name of God. That's a, that was a common phrase used in the Old Testament when we're talking about prophets or we're talking about key figures. They came in the name of the Lord. Um, and then we even take it back a little further and they say they believe Jesus came in the name of of David and the kingdom of David. So I think it's very obvious that they're viewing him as a potential king like they view David. And if you know anything about David, David was a conqueror. David won many battles. The nation of Israel flourished under David's command. He was a man after God's own heart. He sought God in what he did. He was not perfect, but the nation flourished. David made life better for the Israelites. God used David to make life better for the Israelites. So I think it's reasonable to think the Jews were asking for the same thing. The Israelites were expecting Jesus to conquer, to, to remove them from the oppression of the Romans, and to give them a better life. But Jesus didn't come to make their life better. Jesus came to save their souls. Let me say that again. Jesus didn't come to make your life better. Jesus came to save your soul. Yeah, amen, right? Thank goodness, because I wasn't making it happen for myself. But it's ironic when we look at the very last line in verse 10. What do the Israelites actually say? Hosanna in the highest. Save us to the highest. Save us in the fullest. Save us completely. They literally were saying that out loud to Jesus, but had no idea what that even meant. They were just hoping to get out from the oppressions of the Romans, to have a better life. I think it's funny, because I don't think I'm too much different than the Israelites. I know I need saving, but I don't always know what I need saving from. I know that things aren't the way they're supposed to be all the time. I know that I need Jesus, but I don't always know exactly why I need Jesus. I forget. But God doesn't hide that. It's not a secret plan. It's good news. God has a plan. God knows why we need saving, and he makes it known to us. It's not a secret. He's not hiding it and going, you'll figure it out eventually. No, it is out there and in the open for us to see with our own eyes and to experience with our own hearts. That's what the triumphal entry, Holy Week, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ are really all about. He's been revealing that plan to us since the beginning of creation. That it isn't about us having a better life, but it's about our souls and who needs to fill that. Now, you may go, well, that sounds all well and good, but how do you really know that? Well, when I, I read my Bible, and I'm not super smart, but every once in a while I clean something that tells me that. But the Israelites actually had the opportunity to know that long before the triumphal entry. Did you know that? That God actually sent a prophet over 500 years prior 
to tell them the exact events that would take place from the triumphal entry all the way to the death and resurrection. That prophet's name was Zechariah. And in Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 through 11, let me open to that. There we go. He wrote through the words of the wisdom God had given him, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from a frame and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Exact events. Not just a donkey, but a colt, the foal of a donkey, lined out over 500 years prior. But as we read those next events, it really talks about Jesus' reign and why he's here. It's not a secret. God's desire for the Israelites and for us is well known. He has lined that out for us. But when I was reading through this scripture, something God really brought my attention into that last line. And really that last part of, the last, or of verse 11 says, as for you also... Because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Now, if you're like me, you're probably like, what the heck is a waterless pit? Like, I get a pit with no water, but why why use that wording? Why is that significant? Well, a waterless pit actually in those days was a common practice. It was a dried up well, had no water in it any longer but it was used to temporarily hold captives, to hold prisoners. And so this is a practice of of many of the different nations. Um, They would use these to hold captives, put slaves into them, all sorts of things. We even see that in the story of Joseph in the Old Testament when his brothers throw him into a waterless pit. Um, All of that, it, it was a common practice. But what stuck out to that, in that to me, was it hit home that there are things in my life that feel like a waterless pit. There are times that I feel like I am in a temporary prison. Maybe maybe it's something going on in my life that I have no control over, but that's hurtful, and I need somebody to do something about it. Or maybe, for me, I've been following Jesus, and there's a sin that I just can't seem to shake. A temporary prison that comes back up every once in a while. Or maybe, maybe you identify with the prison itself. That you once felt like you were an overflowing well, that Jesus was walking alongside you, that, you, that he was pouring water into you as you poured out into those around you. But now you're in a season where you feel like you're just trying to hold on to the last drops around you. But maybe you feel distance from your Lord and Savior. Maybe you feel like a dried up well. The great thing is, guys, is God's already redeemed that. It doesn't have to be that way. God made a way. Jesus literally says in John chapter 4, verse 14, says, but whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. We don't have to be dried up wells. We don't have to be stuck in temporary prisons of our own sin, of this world, of the things that we cannot control because Jesus made a way. 
In that other part of verse 11 in Zechariah, it says, because of the blood of my covenant with you. Over the next week, and really every day, we have the chance to celebrate the blood of that covenant. The fact that Jesus came down to this earth. He lived a sinless life. Perfect. Nothing that we could say was wrong. But because he loved us so much, he gave up that life. He took our sin upon him, our temporary prisons, our dried up wells. He took that upon him and he died on the cross for that. For you, for me, for all of us. But to know that death had no power over him, he raised three days later so that we could have eternal life with God. We don't have to stay stuck in our waterless pits. We don't have to feel like a dried up well. Jesus made a way. If you've never heard that before, please know that's not my story. That's not the person next to you's story. That is your story. Jesus loves you that much. He gave up everything so that you could have eternal life with him. All we have to do is confess our sins and believe. Say, Jesus, I understand. I'm not enough. I have been struggling. I have been trying. I've been doing everything I can to get out of this waterless pit, and I am stuck. I need you, King and Savior. So we're going to move into a time of ministry to close out our service. I'm going to invite our prayer teams and our uh, pianists. That's right right term for that, but to play for us. And uh, if you, if this is your first time at the vineyard, this is a time where we allow the Holy Spirit to do what only the Spirit can do. And maybe there's something going on in your life that you need prayer for. Maybe you're struggling with something health-wise. Maybe there's some, an event or something going on. Now is a great time to receive prayer. Or maybe you're still thinking about why Jesus came. And if that's you, that's completely okay. I'm going to put two questions up on the screen for you to think about during this time. As Alyssa plays and the prayer teams are around, if you need prayer, go get it. But if not, take time do business with God, ask him these questions because I believe that God will meet you in that moment.